Hello, my name is Peter Warren. Um, today I'm going to be doing my dissertation defense. Uh, I'm doing this to upload it onto YouTube and make it available. Um, once my dissertation is published, I will put that in the, in the caption below the video. Um, I'm just doing this kind of for practice purposes, for my actual defense, and to also make it available uh, on my YouTube channel. So the title of my dissertation well, first, um, my name is Peter Warren. As I said, uh, I'm a graduate student at UCF, uh, currently pursuing a PhD in mechanical engineering, and my advisor is Dr. Rana J. Ghosh. Let me see. Okay, I got the laser pointer here. All right, so um, the title of my dissertation is Machine Learning Applications in Advanced Additive Manufacturing, Process Modeling, Microstructure Analysis, and Defect Detection. So a quick layout of the presentation will go uh, introduction, uh, quick basics on additive manufacturing and machine learning. Then I will go through these four sections here, defect detection, microstructure analysis, particle recycle iteration detection, uh, Martian and lunar binder jetting applications, and then finish off with conclusions. So additive manufacturing. Um, additive manufacturing, if we were to list three strengths of additive manufacturing, we would have adaptability, um, customizable output geometry, unique intricate features. We would have versatility. We have a diverse material selection. And we would have efficiency. We have faster print times, uh, quicker lead times, and that leads ultimately to a quicker design cycle iteration for engineers. Some of the weaknesses for additive manufacturing is inconsistency. Uh, anyone who's used a 3D printer knows that they do uh, tend to make mistakes, even if you're just using a simple PLA one, but that also occurs for the more advanced printers as well. Uh, part cert certification, this is an ongoing process to determine if a part manufactured through these new techniques is can be certified and can be trusted to be implemented in an industrial environment. Uh, this is an ongoing process on how to accurately certify these parts. And then materialization is also a weakness. Um, metals and ceramics are very complex. The processes are longer. There's a lot of different methods. It's hard to determine the best one right now. Uh, so the, the, util the full utilization of being in capability of being able to print metals and ceramics is not quite there yet. Uh, how do we address these? One is non-destructive evaluation, just uh, gathering data from this, from the prints as we do them through imaging, ultrasonics, or any NDE method. Another one is uh, utilizing machine learning. And obviously, the data generated through NDE and the machine learning kind of go hand in hand, and that will be displayed throughout this work. And then the third method of improving additive manufacturing in general is uh, through process development, improvement of methods, further development of methods, and just the classic engineering design cycle, you know, implementation and experimentation. So here are the three problems that I want to address throughout my uh, dissertation, and I will circle back and highlight these as we do so. So let's talk up further about the additive manufacturing and NDE space. Here we have a graph of additing, additive manufacturing uh, in terms of US dollars and, and billions just for the market here. Um, we can see that we're seeing exponential growth um, and that is projected to continue for the next few years. And I've superimposed a trend line here for the NDE requirements. As the additive manufacturing market grows, the NDE required to certify parts will also grow. And on, in this graph, on the y-axis, we have data in exabytes and year on the x-axis. Um, we can see the green line here is data gathered annually through NDE for any industry, not just additive manufacturing. That's a lot of data. To have an expert human analyze and go through all of that data, we're kind of reaching the, the crossing point of the, the possibility of doing that. Here in red, we see the realistic human processing limit, and we're kind of at a tipping point where we need to find some tool to help us process that data. Um, throughout my presentation, obviously, I'll be using machine learning, so machine learning is a great tool to use for that, 
and it can be used to either assist an expert human in analyzing that data or take over the process entirely. Machine learning. So as engineers, we, we have input data, uh, and not just engineers, a lot of different, you know, physics majors, whoever. Uh, we have input data, we have a function, and we have output data. The way we traditionally program or traditionally solve a problem is we have a good knowledge of the input data and the function, so we write a program manually, and this leads us to our output data. Uh, the way machine learning kind of flips that on its head is it says if you have good knowledge of your input data and your output data, you can apply a machine learning algorithm or technique and then learn your function. So we have a little bit less knowledge of the function, but in most cases, this is more efficient. And in most cases, it can be, or I should say in some cases, it can be more accurate. We can get more accurate results, a more accurate uh, correlation between the input data and the output data. So if we look at a step-by-step -step modeling process, whether this is through finite element or analytical modeling, which I did a lot throughout my PhD and mostly in my master's, I did a lot of finite element analysis. Uh, this is a good step-by-step -step method of it or flow chart. Step one, define the problem. Two, define the conditions, whether that's boundary conditions or step size, whatever that may be. Then you go to a solution method and then you solve the problem. After that, we evaluate and then we tune. And step six is the critical point because that's when we can go back, circle back, and determine where we want to improve our model. And um, once we have reached an adequate accuracy, we can deploy it for step seven, prediction. Machine learning is a similar process as I've learned over the past few years. Step one is to gather data. Step two is to prepare the data. Um, that could be in the form of a preliminary data analysis just to explore the data. Step three would be selecting a model, a neural network, a convolutional neural network, a, a recurrent neural network, whatever, whatever the model may be. Um, and then step four to train, step five evaluate, and then tune. We have to tune our hyperparameters. We might even go back and gather more data or prepare the data in a different way. And we just circle back and do the same thing. And then once we have reached adequate accuracy, we can deploy it for prediction. So uh, just a quick basic um, explanation of a neural network. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I want to get into the, the actual work I did. But we have an input layer. We have a fully connected neural network uh, consisting of interconnected neurons uh, fully connected between each layer. They finally reach an output layer. Uh, when we train this, it just goes through a series of mathematical operations which are customizable, whether we're training it and optimizing it or back propagation. Um, whatever the, that may be. And they're often used and most best used for pattern recognition, classification, regression on images, speech, language, and other data. Uh, here we have a graphic of a perceptron, which basically just takes in all of the weights uh, multiplied by the X of the previous layer. All of that gets summed together and then a bias gets added um, and, and the weights get adjusted as the neural network is trained. After this perceptron does this uh, quick mathematical, simple mathematical operation, a nonlinear activation function is typically applied. The most common ones being sigmoid, ReLU, uh, maybe even a leaky ReLU. Um, and this just allows the neural network to capture nonlinear behavior, which is a big strength in, in the neural network. Um, the, the activation functions need to be carefully chosen, especially for the output layer, depending upon what behavior we want to, to capture, whether it's uh, classification or we want a probability output, whatever that may be. So now let's uh, get into the first uh, work I did for this dissertation, which was a little bit of work in defect detection. So in 2020, there was a manufactured sheet steel data set on Kaggle. Um, there was a total of 12,600 training images, 5,500 testing images. Here's the size, 16 by 256. All the images were either defect free or with a defect. Um, the images with defects have encoded pixels indicating the location of the defect and there were a total of four classes of defects. Here are some example images. Now let's do our step two, um, preliminary data analysis or prepare the data. It did not say what the types of defects were. They were only listed as type one through type four. 
Upon examination, it would appear that it's uh, small divots, vertical cracks, surface scratches, and ablations for type 4. Defect 3 is the most common in the, in the data set. And the data set also has about a 50-50 split between having a defect and not having a defect. Um, there also were a few with two or more defects in the, in the images. Okay, so now we need to select a model. Let me quick go over the how we're going to uh, quantify our accuracy for this model. You may think a one-to-one -one ratio between accurately classified pixels would be a good method, but that would not be uh, correct. Here we have an example of a ship finding algorithm using a convolutional neural network. This is 100% accuracy, and this image down here is 95% accurate. So the problem here is that we're not weighing the, the true positives uh, enough. So what the dice score and the IOU score is it puts a little more weight on the true positives um, and a little bit less weight on the true negatives. Um, the equations are, are not too important. Just know that it it's a, currently one of the better ways of image segmentation and classification, accuracy, quantification. It's current, uh, I guess you could say state of the art in those areas. So we're gonna use a convolutional neural network for this work, um, more specifically the ResNet, which is just a, a more, I guess you could say advanced type of convolutional neural network, but I'll just quickly explain what a convolutional neural network does and why it's more uh, better it's uh, better for doing uh, image classification than a traditional neural network we have our image data a three channel matrix um, two dimensional matrix we're going to flatten that into a vector here that's step one and then if we just directly feed that into a neural network it loses its ability to capture spatial awareness and spatial properties and even temporal dependencies as well but in our case we're only interested in the spatial awareness so what a convolutional neural network does is by applying a series of convolutions, here's an example of that shown here, then max pooling, more convolution, then more max pooling. This is a customizable amount that we can implement. Um, after it does that a few times and changes the dimensions of our input matrices, we can then flatten it out and then send it into a fully connected neural network and uh, train it. And this is just a, a better way of classifying, of, of implementing a neural network for, for uh, classification purposes. So here's the results from training on, on this uh, Severstall sheet steel data set. Here we have the IOU score on the ResNet 18. Um, here we have the loss on the ResNet 18. And here we have the dice score on the ResNet 18. We also did the same for the ResNet 50. Those are just different architectures for a convolutional neural network. Um, they're I, you couldn't say they're the best out there right now, but they were very good and they were groundbreaking when they came out in uh, 2015, I believe. So what these graphs are basically showing is that we do have a convergence. We're not overtraining. Um, we have a validation and training set. They, they converge. Maybe we could have cut it off at 35, but we haven't begun to overtrain yet at, at 40 epics. So that's all these graphs are really showing. This is the important result here, uh, and this is what we published a few years ago, which was just using the basic ResNet 18 and ResNet 50 and standard training procedures, we were able to provide benchmarks to the community um, that we also scored in the top 100. The top score on the public was 0.92, and we're a little bit off of that. But the private data set is a data set that no one has access to. You submit your algorithm and Kaggle will implement it on the data set. We scored a 0.88 with the ResNet 50 and the max score the top score was 0.91 so we're only three percentage points away that's a very good result here we have some of the hyperparameters that we used for the for this work so the result of this is we are able to immediately um, take an image of sheet steel detect defects segment the defects and classify the defects so this is a a great tool that can be used for a lot of different fields in engineering, but in our case, additive manufacturing could certainly be deployed on uh, additive manufacturing, and it could attack the inconsistencies that occur during uh, printing for additive manufacturing over 
uh, all of the various forms of, of additive manufacturing. You could make a case that it attacks these two problems as well, but it most specifically attacks the problem of inconsistency and printing errors in additive manufacturing. So now let's step forward into the next portion of this, which we have uh, microstructure analysis. And step one is going to be gather the data. We have these SEM images and optical images of variously manufactured uh, through additive manufacturing stainless steel. This is from a BJT binder jetting on an X1. This is from a fully uh, fused filament fabrication, the Mark Forge Metal X. Here we have SLS, selective laser centering, just a few different types. Um, and what we're looking at here is grain measurements. That's the, the purpose of this work. We want to be able to accurately measure the grains. So the data set that we produce that has the best uh, grain boundaries uh, for, for segmentation here is this uh, X1, and I'll explain how we gathered this data, but just quick, quickly, the benefits of accurate grain measurements is a direct relationship with material mechanical properties. We can optimize the additive manufacturing processes and even deploy multi-scale modeling. The biggest challenge here is polishing, etching, and imaging, etching being maybe the most challenging portion of that, and then classification of grains and grain boundaries and the next slide uh, explains these very well. So here we have zoomed in on the grain and uh, th these are grains here. And this is a grain and this is a grain boundary here. These are small grain fragments. We're not interested in that. Here, this, this long line across here is a uh, polishing scratch. So we don't want to classify that as a grain boundary. And here we have some pores and impurities. So the problem statement is to classify each pixel as either a grain or grain boundary correctly and not get confused by all of the challenges here. Um, let's look at some of the current state-of-the-art methods in, in image segmentation. Um, one is manual thresholding, uh, two gradient-based approaches, three the HED method, and four manual segmentation. Um, this is an example of manual thresholding. This is an example of a gradient-based approach. And this is an example of the HED method. The HED method is just a specific neural network trained to determine boundaries or edges in an image. It's actually titled the holistically nested edge detection method. Um, so that's what this image is here. And the manual segmentation would be drawing it as a human, just going in and marking it. So we did all four of these to our data set of grain boundary images. Uh, here's an example of manual thresholding, an example step-by-step -step of the gradient-based approach. Uh, here's an example of the holistically nested edge detection going from right to left. And here we have manual segmentation by human. So these boundaries were actually drawn by me uh, bit by bit for the entirety of the data set. Uh, we filter out the data based on size and perimeter of the grains. If the perimeter is too long or if the size is too small, we will simply filter it out. So we can see some of the data getting deleted because it's not an accurate representation of a grain. Uh, Gradient-based approach, a lot of data is getting deleted. And the best approach is the manually segmented method. Also it looks in this case that the HED method also does quite well. So here's our data set, uh, 480 total images. These were printed on a binder jet printer, the X1 Innovin X. Uh, it was stainless steel 316L. The images are taken at 250X via the optical microscope. They were polished and etched in our lab. They were etched using marbles etchant. Um, all four segmentations were applied. All of this data was published on Kaggle. So now we can begin implementing uh, some machine learning based approaches. Uh, but before I implement the machine learning based approaches, let me discuss grain measurements. So we can look at it from a perspective of total grain area and total grain boundary area. And here we see about a 75 to 25 percent split. The rest of them uh, are not doing as well. So this is manual segmentation here. Um, that will be regarded as our ground truth. And here we have manual segmentation here as well regarded as our ground truth. So we, we can make some numerical comparisons here. And uh, let me explain the planimetric shape measurements as well. We have average Y diameter, diameter measured in every Y direction 
and then take the average of that. Same with x. Uh, circularity is this formula here. Aspect ratio is just x over y. Uh, the numerical data is not, uh, it is important, but we don't need to look at every single number here. What I'm just trying to convey here is that it is important to not just look at a dice score when we move into classification and also look at how accurate our grain measurements are. Because we may have a good dice score accuracy, but if we're not getting accurate grain data, what purpose is that to the material scientist? So we need to keep that in mind as we move forward and uh, apply a novel machine learning method, uh, which I will explain now. So we already have some data, some real data that we have developed and manual through manual segmentation and the various other uh, segmentation methods I mentioned. But now let's develop an artificial grain image. So we could do that using a generative adversarial neural network. I'm sure everyone's heard of that, the GANs. But that's a very data intensive process. So what if typically people don't take 480 SEM images when they're looking at uh, the microstructure of a metal. So this is just a, a method to generate data. And the way that uh, we did this was by plotting random points and then applying a Voronoi tessellation pattern and separating those points from each other at the maximum furthest distance. So here's an example of the Voronoi tessellation here. Next, let's plot some random pores and scratches. Let's convert the whole thing to black and white and apply some Gaussian noise. And this is what our final image looks like. It looks somewhat similar to our grain images, just a more, uh, not as natural looking, but it's, it's the same basic concept. So here's our artificial data set that we created. Here's a, the original mask. This is what the convolutional neural network will want to predict. And here's some example of the different uh, sets of images that we have. Uh, set one, two, and three, and just applying various amounts of blurring, whether it's Gaussian blurring, median blurring, um, just a lot of different basic input image techniques. We also varied the amount of black dots and, and scratches. So it's not super important, the variation that we put into the data set, just that we have uh, 800 images of artificially generated grains through a standard mathematical graphical procedure. So let's pull out the UNET. The UNET is just another convolutional neural network, a basic one. We're not even gonna use the ResNet for this. We're just gonna use a very standard uh, UNET to get some baseline on when we train our data to segment the grains. Uh, and we're gonna customize the training sets on different compositions of these graphs, these uh, images here. So let's look at sets one through five. Set one is fully manually segmented grains. Set five is fully artificial grains. So this is one of the most interesting results from this work, keep that in mind, set five. Uh, set two, three, and four are just a mix of manual segmentation and artificial. Uh, set six through 10 are a mix of various amounts of pre-processed data using the segmentation methods that I described earlier, whether that's the gradient-based approach, the manual threshold approach, or the HED method. Also some Voronoi tessellation was included. This is just some, uh, not as straightforward of an exercise here that I'm doing. It's more of just random experimentation and, and seeing what comes out. So if we look at our grain dimensional, dimensional measurement errors, um, so we're regarding manual segmentation as ground truth. Uh, as we move further into the red, uh, we, that's more error, or further into the blue, that's over prediction. So under prediction, over prediction, uh, if you see a darker color, that's not good. Set one, we can see the colors are very light. Most of them are lo looking pretty well. It's hard to sit here and examine this whole thing within a few uh, seconds, but uh, we'll, we'll do our best here. We have a manual threshold, gradient-based approach, and HD method. All of these do, in general, worse than all of the machine learning-based approaches. So this is just kind of confirming that we are getting good, accurate grain dimensional measurements using these machine learning-based approaches. We get a little bit away from that uh, when we step into 
the training set five, which is composed entirely of artificial data. But some of the measurements are accurate. The circularity gets a little bit away from us. But let's let's look at the dice score now. So dice scores of traditional methods. Um, remember, manual segmentation is ground truth. Uh, manual threshold does the best, which was surprising. HED method, which had the most accurate grain measurements, has the worst dice score. So that's just the importance of looking at both measurement accuracy quantification methods. Look at it from the perspective of a material science and a machine learning data scientist. Uh, now let's look at the dice score for the various units that I displayed. Remember set one was fully manually segmented data and set five was fully artificially generated data which scored incredibly high at 87 percent. Um, it never trained on any artificial data I mean on any actual grain data and here we can look at some qualitative results from that. We have the mask prediction overlay, the mask prediction by itself, the manually segmented overlay, and the manual segmentation itself. Look at the similarities between these two images, and what we're seeing is that they're, they're pretty similar for something that's never trained on any grain data, and then these two images are just other, to, to show a proof of concept, these are other stainless steel images not produced from this data set, and it's still doing a good job of segmenting those grain boundaries. Um, this is just an example of set three doing it. Uh, set three was a 50-50 artificial to manual segmentation. We can see a very similar uh, mask prediction here. So it's kind of incredible how good of a job these convolutional neural networks are doing at segmenting these. What is this? Uh, circling back to our main problem statement, this is a very assistive tool in part certification. By you know, we're going to need new testing requirements for these parts. It's a new technology. By getting accurate microstructure data, data we can get accurate results. We, we, we have a better knowledge of our component after it's printed. And we can use that to, to further improve these methods. I mean, typically you want to maximize grains. Um, so that's, that's one method that, that you can do it. And you can pull a lot more data out of these as well. So now let's step into the next uh, portion of this um, presentation here, and we're going to start talking about LPBF, a uh, laser powder bed fusion. It's a type of additive manufacturing. It's typically used on metallic components. It's arguably the state-of-the-art metallic additive manufacturing method right now. Here is how it works. Two powder beds. This one goes up. This one goes down. Fresh powder is rolled on the top, a high-powered laser rasters across the surface, and it uh, centers it, and that's it rolling the fresh powder on there. Um, the, the powder recycle iteration problem description, let's talk about that. So we have all this powder in here. We've just printed a part. We're going to take that part out, and we want to save all this unused powder. We don't want to just throw that in the trash. That's that's good quality stainless steel powder. So we sieve it through a 40 micron filter and the soot is discarded. Uh, the stuff that is caught in the sieve is also discarded. The soot is the stuff that is the, the remnants on the sides of the powder bed. So can we quantify the health of this powder after use? Can we make sure that our powder is still good to be used? Um, and can we use machine learning for that? Let's, let's talk about it. The final goal of this project is to reduce the resolution of the images to get faster prediction. But for a proof of concept, we have to start with high resolution images. We have to start with SEM and see if we can do it on that. Eventually, we want to move to flatbed scanner images and see if we can, with this low resolution image, utilize machine learning. But for the purposes of this project, we are going to be sticking in the range of SEM Critical var variables listed here. Uh, for here, the main ones we're gonna look at are area, perimeter, and inverse circularity. So here we have another data set, uh, another data set that got published on Kaggle as well. Um, 256 by 256 black and white images, 11 categories, 240 images per category, uh, 2640 total images. We got 
all of these different uh, cycles here, cycle zero through cycle five. What that means is we got fresh powder through five recycled iteration cycles. Um, so that means it's got sieved out five times total. It's gone through five prints. Uh, so 3B, 4B, and 5B are sieve collected powder. So the B stands for big, but you could also stand for bad. It's powder that we don't want to use. And soot stands for its S, 4S and 5S. That's the soot collected from the sides of the powder bed. And we have SEM images, SEM images of all of these. So how are we going to segment these into particles? I didn't want to manually segment all of these again. I got a little bit tired of doing that. So instead, let's just apply a simple technique using the holistically nested edge detection. So we have our black and white image. We apply holistically nested edge detection. We subtract those edges to further darken in the edges of the particles. Then we can apply an adaptive mean threshold it's not too important to know what all of this is, but basically the output is uh, segmented into individual particles. Obviously, we filtered out the smaller ones. Um, we can segment them and overlay them on the image here. We're going to count total particles, calculate area, calculate circularity, and filter out the data that we don't want, which is what I just mentioned. So let's look at our preliminary data analysis. Uh, here we have area, perimeter, and inverse circularity. Here we have the numerical data of that. Um, remember our circularity formula is a ratio between area and perimeter. It goes from one to zero. One is a perfect circle. Zero is uh, probably an unknown object that's an absolutely not perfect circle. Um, you know, like a square is like around 0.5 or something for, for reference. Um, inverse circularity we have p squared over 4 pi a, so it's just the inverse of circularity. It goes from 1 to infinity. Uh, for this one, I used uh, the inverse circularity to, to display the results better. I, I liked using that more, basically. Um, let's look at our average area and just the distribution of areas going up from cycle 0 to cycle 5. We can see a slight increase in the skew towards larger areas. Uh, cycle four, we see a little bit of a drop, so that's kind of inexplicable. And then cycle five, a large increase. So, you know, it's the first collection of experimental data using this. There could be unknown errors occurring in this process. But uh, we, we also see cycle three B, four B, five B, four S and five S all significantly larger areas. A little bit of a comparison between five and four S and five S. And the same pattern seems to flow from perimeter and inverse circularity. Now let's use a machine learning based approach. Let's get the ResNet 18 convolutional neural network. Let's train uh, good versus bad, early versus late um, for sets one and two. So just two categories. Can we tell the difference between good and bad? Okay, then after that, can we tell the difference between early and late cycle? And then after that, let's make it harder. Can we tell the difference between early, late, soot, and bad? And then set four is the biggest challenge can we detect the exact recycle iterations uh, number and also detect if it's bad so if we get cycle three powder can we say with certainty that that is cycle three uh here's our hyperparameters. our test train split is the only one that's kind of important to know that's 80 20 so 20 percent of the data was put in the testing set and not trained with uh, here's our epic versus loss graphs again. Just showing this to show you that I'm not overtraining any of this. It's all legitimate. This is just standard stuff here. Uh, we had four different training sets listed here. Here are the four epic versus loss graphs there. A uh, little bit of a spike there. I don't know what that was, but it goes back down. And I'm, if it if it stayed down for a long time, that's how you know there's a potential for overtraining. Let's look at the results. Training set accuracy, testing set accuracy, combined accuracy. The most critical one that we should examine, I give them all here for clarity, but testing set accuracy is the most important. If it's doing good on the testing set, that means it's actually doing good. That's data it hasn't trained on. Good versus bad, 99.5% accuracy. Early versus late, 96.3% accuracy. 
Set three, early, late, soot, bad, 93% accuracy, and most impressively, set four, uh, cycles zero through five, and also bad powders as well, prediction at 93% accuracy. So let's look at the confusion matrices and see which ones that they're getting wrong for sets three and four. I think sets one and two, we can pretty confidently state that yes, we can tell the difference between good and bad powder. And we can also pretty well tell the difference between early and late cycle powder. Uh, the confusion matrix for the four class, uh, we can see that the most confusion is coming between early and late cycle predictions and also from bad powder and soot powder predictions. So that's good. That means it's actually taking in some of the powder data. The seven class, we see a similar thing. If it's going to confuse, here's the true label cycle two. If it's going to miss uh, predict cycle two, it mispredicts it as cycle three. It mispredicts one as cycle fresh. And uh, th that's it. So there's a good proximity of actual cycle to prediction of the cycle. Um, and I should mention that these confusion matrices were only done on the test set. So I'm not uh, cheating in any way here. This is just from the testing set. And uh, bad powder gets a 100% accuracy, but cycle five did predict three images of bad powder. That could indicate that, yeah, maybe the powder is crossing a threshold and, and getting a little bit more questionable as we approach uh, higher recycle iteration counts. So the conclusions from this, uh, I'm going to go into the conclusions more at the end of the presentation, but I think uh, conclusion number three is the most important. Some particle recycle iteration data is informing the CNN classification decision due to the proximity of recycle iteration prediction from the data set with seven classes. So because it's mispredicting it as a nearby cycle iteration count, that means that it's not just cheating or, or seeing some, you know, something in these images that we're not, because it's black box, right? We're talking about neural networks. It might be catching a clue on the lighting or, or something that we're not catching. But because of the proximity, I think we can conclude that it is taking into account at least some actual particle data and it's particle images. So it should, that, that shouldn't be a very controversial conclusion. To draw. So what does this attack? This attacks both inconsistency and part certification. Um, we've attacked both of these quite well. So now it's time to move into materialization, uh, development of new processes or development of existing processes on new materials. And this is kind of a cool part of the presentation. 3D printing uh, using Martian and lunar regolith, uh, a binder jet background and challenges binder jetting. Uh, we're going to conduct a centering investigation and characterization. We're going to examine the powder and binder uh, interaction. So let's look at a diagram of how BJT works. Um, should look familiar. We just saw LPBF, very similar. Um, the only difference being liquid binder reservoir, not a laser. It drips a small amount of glue or a binder, whatever you want to call it, uh, layer by layer onto the image, onto the uh, powder bed. It cures. At the end, you remove the part and um, could be a weakness, could be a strength, whatever you want to call it. The LPBF is already centered because it used the laser. This one now has to go into a centering oven. So uh, that, that's the only difference there. But we're doing this for, for something else now. We're looking at Martian and Lunar uh, printing with this. So we're going to look at the key stages. It's kind of a feasibility investigation, if you will. We're going to look at printing, the powder binder interaction, and we're going to look at centering. Uh, centering, what are the challenges with that? Well, there's a lot of challenges with centering. It's a complex physical process. There's a lot of different parameters. Um, here's an example of some stainless steel that got oxidized in a tube furnace. It wasn't centered at too high of a temperature. It was centered in the wrong environment. Um, and that caused a lot of oxid oxidation and it messed up the whole tube furnace. So that's not good. We don't want to do that. Um, 
here is how we're going to characterize powder and binder interaction. We can track it using machine learning, <laughs> which is a common theme. Um, we can track the wetted area uh, over time, and we can track the perimeter and the area of that. Um, lots of different parameters we can play with in there as well. Uh, so here's an example of the image tracking being deployed. These are preliminary results. These results weren't published in the, in the publication that we did on this stuff. This is kind of looking more towards the future. But it's just I'm just wanted to show it because it's really neat. Uh, on, the, on the Martian image, we have a much more coarse powder, average particle size of 90 microns. The liquid gets dispersed into the powder right away. It takes less than a second. This is lunar dust. It has a much smaller average particle size. And we can see how long it's taking the lunar uh, dust to absorb the binder material. Uh, in both cases, the binder material is salt water, 10 to 1. The challenges of this are understanding the behavior. We want to maximize green density, control green geometry. Also, I should mention green is after the binder has been applied, but before centering has occurred. So that's all that green means there. Um, solutions to this, solution to the challenge of understanding this behavior is being able to view and model it. That's always the solution. This is a tool that can be used to get accurate in situ data just for the surface, unfortunately. And uh, we can determine ideal saturation, ideal distribution rates by, by using this technique. Uh, but let's jump into the centering investigation now. So here we have some Martian regolith. Uh, the Martian and lunar regolith was supplied by Exolith Labs, uh, Professor Dan Britt over here at UCF, actually. Um, he supplied us with this, this powder here, and uh, it's very cool that he is here at UCF. But uh, anyway, we use the MGS one and the LMS one, saltwater binder, um, and the saltwater binder, there is salt present in some of these environments, so that was part of the uh, selection process for that. Um, the three PLA printed molds uh, mold these things into little cylindrical uh, samples here. We placed them gently into the molds to mimic the binder jet process. We allowed them one hour to harden, and then we removed them and begun the centering process. So the centering process was 200 degrees C for one hour and then split into three categories, um, 1,000, 1,100, and 1,200 C for one hour. The statistical weight was five. So that, if you do the math, is 30 total samples, 15 Martian, 15 lunar, uh, five at each temperature, five at 1,000, five at 1,100, and five at 1,200. Here we have the optical results, a top view of the cylindrical samples. Uh, we can see some oxidation starting to occur at the 1200C samples. Um, let's zoom in a little further on this and look at some more stuff. Uh, one thing that we conclude from this work is the, the uh, binding capability of the salt water for both the Martian and the lunar regolith. Uh, from the image powder to green. So remember, green is post binder application, pre center application. Uh, we can see a nice bind beginning to occur um, just from these two images. You can kind of see how it's acting as a glue. Uh, next, we can move to 1000C, 1100C, and 1200C. Not much of a difference between 1000 and 1100. But once we go to the 1200C category, we see a lot of melting has occurred. We have like kind of a glassy surface. A lot of oxidation has occurred. Uh, at least one of the elements within this rocky regolith substance has melted and uh, created a good hard uh, substance. So let's go a little further here. Let's look at the shrinkage that occurred during sintering. Minimal shrinkage for 1,000 and 1,100, more shrinkage occurring in the 1,200C regime. Uh, <clears throat> the discrepancies between the radial and the height shrinkage is due to the fact, um, at least in part, the fact that they were centered upright. 
So as it centers and it shrinks in the vertical direction, it can cause expansion in the radial direction, negating some of the shrinkage that occurs. And we saw more of that for the lunar samples. So radial shrinkage, this is due to the gravitational effects, as I just mentioned, and also the built-in anisotropic properties during the manufacturing process. So now let's let's break these things and see how strong they are. Let's put them on an MTS machine, and uh, we're also going to do digital image correlation to get the strain. Um, here's some of the results from that. We don't get a very strong product until we're centering it at 1,200 degrees C, uh, and then we are in the regime of standard brick. Uh, here's a comparison to other uh, lunar and Martian material manufacturing techniques presented in in previous works. Uh, some of them do get a much higher result, but that's due to a lot of pre-processing. Kind of the strength of our method was we're only putting salt water in it to bind it and then centering it. It's uh, not a lot of pre-processing uh, going into it. We're not milling it, we're not compressing it, we're not doing anything, we're just doing a, a simple process and still getting a pretty high uh, compressive strength. Now let's look at the DIC results. Here we can see it for the lunar samples and here we can see it for the Martian samples. This is the classic stress strain curve, engineering strain percent on the X axis, stress on the Y. Uh, as it increases in stress, we take snapshots of it uh, through the DIC. Quick explanation to DIC, white paint, black speckle pattern, you put a camera on it, it observes the black dots and it obtains the correlation and you can basically get a strain map, a, a in situ strain map of the, of the sample. So as it compresses, we can see at stress 0.3, we're starting to see this vertical crack. And the vertical crack was a kind of an interesting thing. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the conclusions that we can draw for this is that material stiffening occurs at about 1% engineering strain. That's due to compaction. The DIC shows a rapid increase in strain just prior to failure. We can see that in red here. Uh, failure occurred during about 2 to 3% engineering strain. We can conclude this is a brittle material. And because of the vertical cracks in that failure method, we weren't able to model this behavior in Abacus using traditional models because there must be some built-in anisotropic properties causing this thing to crack in a vertical method rather than on the shear plane like you would expect um, that uh, Abacus was not able to sufficiently uh, reproduce. So that's kind of another interesting uh, result that we obtained while doing this work. So we have now attacked all three of these problems. Um, Th through this work, um, this one most specifically towards materialization. It was the development of a new uh, material process, a new material using an existing 3D printing process. But um, I feel that it, we have uh, adequately done, done our best at uh, contributing to the world of advanced additive manufacturing. And through the, and the attack vector that we used was through NDE and machine learning, the combination of those two. The conclusions, um, I'm not gonna read all of these. I'll just read the first one because it's kind of what I wanna do moving forward in my career. This, this, a lot of this work is pretty recent that I did here because it really sparked my interest. I've done a lot of work with NDE throughout, you know, even in my masters, I did a lot of work with finite element and stuff like that, but that I kind of learned as I learned more machine learning techniques that the processing of NDE data, the marriage between those two things, uh, NDE generates lots of data, machine learning very good at processing that data. There's just a, a lot of ground, a lot of work that could be done in this area in integrating these two uh, fields. And I, I find that very interesting. In this case, we did it mostly towards uh, advanced additive manufacturing, which is another super interesting area. There's just a lot of uh, work that I can do moving forward. So I'm very grateful 
to, uh, here, well, here's uh, references available in the dissertation and contributing publications, all of that stuff there. Um, very grateful to my committee, all of them, um, Dr. Kapat, Dr. Radovan, Dr. Supthankar, and Dr. Ghosh. And I even put Dr. Subramanian Ramesh from Siemens in here because he's uh, been pretty vital in my PhD process as well. Uh, just a big thank you to everyone on this slide uh, for, for all of your feedback and all of your help over the, over the years. Uh, thank you to all of my lab mates over the years as well. Uh, thank you to all of my lab mates over the years as well. I think it just froze for a second. Hopefully this is still going. Um, really appreciate all of them. And finally, thank you to my son. My son was born in 2015. That was my first semester at UCF. Um, he attended a senior design meeting with me. Uh, he was there when I started my first semester of graduate school with Dr. Ghosh. Uh, he went with me to the Turbo Expo in Norway. Uh, we also recently went to the Turbo Expo in Rotterdam just last year. That was a lot of fun. He's been to the lab. This is our lab over in the Barbara Ying Center where I was making a dog ball launcher for a project in one of my classes. Um, just, it's pretty cool that I think that he was born my first semester at UCF and today I'm finishing that process uh, with the PhD. Thank you and any questions?